Knowledge is not power. That's actually not correct. The application of knowledge is actually power. This is the game. The game is for us to see how far we can take this life. I don't care if anyone labels that as crazy or not. The same spark that created everything in the universe, that divine energy is in every single atom in their body. You have some free time? Go learn something, like start to build off of something in your mind. Start to follow those passions, like Billy said, incorporate things like meditation and getting out and being appreciative of like your existence in your life. What's happening people? Today's guests are Billy Carson and Matt LaCroix, two people who truly do not need an introduction. They are absolute juggernauts in the fields of ancient and alternate history. They've co-authored the book, epic of humanity which seeks to understand all of the lost or misunderstood treasures from ancient civilizations you can catch these guys all over the place they're all over the internet we've actually already done two podcasts with both of them and one together so we've got a full going series right now with these guys do not miss the knowledge that is dropped on this podcast from manifesting to ufos to the way you should be acting in a world that is out also potentially to get you enjoy the podcast John. What's happening, people? Welcome back to another beautiful podcast, a beautiful night and day. I have two of my favorite people to talk to in the world. That is no joke. All of you guys, I'm sure, uh, have seen the podcast that we have done separately and together, which have been big hits, which is why they're back. We have Billy Carson, Matt LaCroix. What's up, guys? Welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back on and Matt back on as well. Of course, I'm Billy Carson, a.k.a. Forbidden Knowledge. It's going to be a great discussion today. Looking forward to it. Will and Billy, I love talking to you guys. Some of my favorite two people in the world. So this is going to be a great discussion. It's great to get together again. Awesome. So uh, last time we spoke, uh, there was a book in the works, which I believe is shortly going to be with us, uh, which is perfect for those of us that are that are fans. So uh, the Epic of Humanity, why don't we start there? We've got a lot to cover in this. We're going to get to uh, you know the, the veil that's been placed over us by, by society, the media. We're going to get a little bit of the, what's in the current zeitgeist with the AI and stuff like that. And we're going to obviously bring it on home with uh, the knowledge and things that you guys have learned, which is one of the greatest things that I think you guys are providing to your people, which is that you guys both do serious research. I mean, you, you, you both have to be commended for actually taking the time to do that, not just reading a little of this or reading something else. You guys are traveling all over the world, learning stuff, doing stuff. So uh, we always appreciate that. But that's just a little bit of a, a shout out. So uh, Billy, the Epic of Humanity, why don't you tell us what your part is? We'll get into uh, to Matt's side and we'll go from there. Sure, definitely. You know, I, I, um, I really admire Matt so much because he's one of the very few people on this planet, and I mean literally, that have really done real research and when it comes to ancient texts, ancient tabs, ancient civilizations, um, and being able to tie, you know, make the connect the dots and tie the ancient past to the current era. And uh, so I decided I wanted to take a trek and I took a trek out to see him in Maine uh, a couple years ago. And, you know, that's when we got to talking and speaking about, you know, uh, potentially doing some work together. And the Epic of Humanity was actually a great name that he came up with. And it would, you know, it's, it's just the greatest honor to be able to co-write a book with someone that literally does the work. So many people out here have pretended to do the work. They have gone on TV shows. They've gone on all these big podcasts. They've gone on, on major broadcasts like mainstream media. And when I see them in person, I ask them a couple of questions. They don't know the answer. They haven't read any of this stuff. They never went like research it for themselves. They, oh, no, I don't know. I don't read those things. I'm like, what you're talking about it. So, but Matt is like, I mean, literally, and I don't want to sound like I'm just jumping off, but this guy literally does the work. And so it's an honor to partner with him and have the opportunity to write this book uh, with Matthew LaCroix, because I know it's going to, when it comes out and we've had a couple of speed bumps and hurdles, but when this thing really hits the street, it's going to explode on the consciousness of the people on this planet. And the book primarily is covering a lot of ancient texts and tablets. And I'm really going to cover how do I connect the ancient past to the modern era, as well as how do I, based on what we've learned now about the ancient past, how do we escape this matrix? And that's really what I'll be delving deep into in this book, 
And Matt, if you want to tell a little bit, a little bit more about, you know, your, the aspects of what you've been working on and how, what you came up with on your side. Thank you. First of all, uh, Will, it's great to sit down and talk to you again. And Billy, um, it's always an honor. You and I haven't done a video in a, in a little while. We've both been busy on other projects and finishing the book, as you just uh, discussed a second ago. So it's really nice to sit down again. I just want to say um, it truly is an honor for you to say such kind things about me. I feel the same about you. And I think that's the whole reason why you and I decided to do this collaboration and this project in the first place. Because it's not about whether or not you want to just regurgitate information from what someone else says. And you say like, oh, well, I heard that someone described the atrahasis and this is how they described it. So I don't know if I agree with it or not, but well, what do you mean? Why didn't you, why don't you go in and try to break it down yourself and then study the origins of where all the terms and the history comes in and then formulate an opinion based on something you've studied. And that's what Billy and I do. We take the ancient past, we connect it to the present and we try to bridge a gap between connecting a story that has been nearly lost to all of us. I mean, and to me, it's such a tragedy. I try to imagine what it would have been like to be a truly ancient civilization that existed well over 12,000 years ago. To have, imagine, you know, blossoming with laws and rules that come out of these ancient origins of where this like model of civilization emerged. And you create like a grand civilization and you have all these stories that encompass your civilization, right? Whether you're not talking about the ancient ancient Athenians and Atlantean story, or you're talking about the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians, there's, there are these incredible stories that go back so much further than all of mainstream academia is willing to admit, and that we learn about in history books, and we get this fragmented view of who we are and how far back our story goes. And so this the pr primary purpose of this, working with another great mind like Billy, was to combine our efforts of, of our understanding of ancient history, but to create something that's in a chronological order that tells what our story is. Not from the perspective of saying, um, well, you know, we discovered stones and sticks and fire. No, 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 not that story. How about this rise of grand civilizations out of nowhere in this history that's seemingly forgotten to tell those stories of, of those civilizations that emerged were destro destroyed by incredible catastrophes on the earth and then left behind these little fragments of who we are and what we've been through. And then the survivors of those stories can tell our story and then we can protect it in these ancient texts in this, in this book. And that's what this book is. It's can we take and take this epic, and I mean E-P-I-C, not epic as in time, but an epic story that we've gone through, and can we record it with all the most important ancient texts in a way to put together like a, like a comprehensive academic um, background on, on our incredible story? So when someone says like, wow, like um, – Baru Tutu had a son, you know, named Unti and Apishtim that was a, the last king of this entire civilization that then, you know, survived this catastrophe. Well, what happened to him? And what happened to that entire story? And what evidence do you even have that, that his story was real and it's not just a myth or a story? And that's what this is about. And so I want to bring to life our story so we can feel all the things that we've gone through and experienced to get to this point and try to remember all that we've forgotten and lost in the past. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this is, it's, it's so, it's so important, all the stuff that you guys are doing. And it's very interesting because it's very hard to research this stuff. And that brings me to the first point here. Uh, the work that you guys are doing is necessary because piecing together, like you guys said, it's such a massive massive thing. So the very first thing I want to get into, because somebody who is either hearing this the first time or that is interested, it hasn't, hasn't gone there. Billy and I spoke about this just before uh, we got on, but the, the, the veil that's pulled over us, whether that's intentionally or unintentionally by academia, by the mainstream media and stuff like this, how first do we address what's going on and why, uh, that is there before we can then get into what the ancient mystery schools, what they were teaching, how that applies to us practically. So maybe you could first give us an understanding of somebody who's coming to this and saying, well, uh, what, what's, what's going on? How, how is this right. you know, fact? Well, people are under the illusion of reality of history. They don't really have the true history. And we've been programmed and we've been fed this information from the time we're born until the current age we are now, whatever that is for that person. 
And the majority of that information has been curated heavily. And the purpose behind this curation of the history or his story is to basically give us a one-sided view with no perspective. And that view that we have right now that we're living under, it allows them to profit immensely from it. They have a lot of systems in place that allow us to not only box ourselves in consciously, but also physically and mentally. And so what these systems do is allow them to capitalize on, on us, keep us in different statuses, keep us from even thinking that we can grow beyond our current programming code. And I do mean programming code. And so by doing that, they keep their boot on humanity's neck 24 seven. And the true history, if we really were able to tap into it and be taught that from a very early age, we will understand the true power that's inside of each and every one of us. And then we will begin to question the status quo. We will begin to say, hey, wait a minute. Why are we falling underneath your boot? Why, are you, why do you have your boot on my neck? We don't even need you. Like, we are so powerful. We're so great. We're just going to organize and come together and unite. And we're going to recreate a new uh, utopia. We're going to create a new paradigm here. And they know this because once a person's mind is expanded, it can never go back. So they keep the brain and the mind so small and so tight and compact, keep you laboring nonstop, keep you working and slaving and worrying about the next bill and the next, next meal, while they themselves have brought heaven to earth and they maximize everything and they live off of that, as well as, in my opinion, they eat the energy of the people through energy vampirism. And that's one of the reasons, and Matt may, may have something else to add to that. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, and I would just like I add on to that well, well put together I guess an understanding of like, well, why do I care about our past? You know, what does that do for me? I don't care about something that happened thousands of years ago. That doesn't impact me now. You know, that's boring to learn about that kind of thing. Well, this is the whole point of why we're doing what we're doing, because there's a story here. There's a story here that's almost been nearly lost, that there are certain individuals and there are powerful people throughout history that want this story to never, ever exist again, almost like it never did exist. So we can we can almost live in this com complete illusion of who we think we are and where we've been. And it goes into so many layers. And, and Billy touched on this before. It's not simply about us understanding where we've been and who we are. And as powerful as those two things are, it goes so much deeper than that. It's about understanding something that has been hidden from us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and getting into the core of, like Billy said, who we really are in terms of the power that we actually have available to us, being co-creators of reality here and existing in a way where we are fundamentally like the universe itself existing in a physical body and this physical third dimensional plane in this reality. And that doesn't mean a flat plane in terms of a physical plane, but when you're looking at dimensional existences in different realities and realms, existing where we do right now in this physical reality, this is the only place where manifestation is physical. Everything else above us and below us in terms of realms or dimensions is in an aspect that is beyond, it's almost invisible to us. It's beyond our, our comprehension. So when we think about, you know, our, our purpose here in this, in this world, this beautiful planet that's, you know, one of trillions in, that, that exists throughout the solar system galaxy and throughout all the galaxies that exist in the universe, we may be something far more important than it, that, that it seems on paper. You know, look at it and say, well, if there's all those other million, you know, trillions of worlds out there, then what does it matter that's happening on Earth? And what does it matter about us? If it's truly, if there's infinite worlds, then there's infinite life, right? Well, the ancients don't, don't say, see it that way. The way that they saw it was that we are powerful creators that come from something that's nearly been forgotten, a source that comes from some kind of a creators in the universe that seem to go to have the ability to do things that almost seems impossible to us. And we came into existence in something that comes from a complexity of something more primitive with something incredibly complex. And that story of how we came into existence and how that created um, this this model of, of who we perceive ourselves today is very different than when it began. And I think the, the purpose here, what we're trying to do is recreate an ancient history that identifies 
all these incredible things about us that if we were to know the truth about would fundamentally change everything in our reality from how we go about doing our daily lives and jobs to how we view everything from like war and technology and uh, anything in the material realm and distractions and laws and rules in ways that were, like Billy said, ways that were governed to, to exist in this very small, very simplistic uh, mindset that is basically keeping us trapped in this illusion of reality where we are doing these things, you know, working and going to going home and then just kind of going to sleep. And then before we, before we know it, our life just, it just fl flickers and flashes before our eyes. And we haven't really done anything, especially when we consider the fact that we could be, you know, exploring the wonders of the universe and understanding all the secrets on how to basically tap into something that we just fully haven't grasped yet as this human story. And so I'm so excited for releasing a, a text that basically encompasses not only our ancient past and who we are and all these struggles we've been through, but like Billy said, now also how to get out of some of this programming to free ourselves, to finally like break out of that hole in the fence, to run free and just see this incredible reality that exists all around us that really most people don't even know is there. And it's a powerful thing. Um, and what I want to touch on is because both of you guys mentioned distractions and it's a, everyone's well aware of all the distractions that we now have in this current. I don't know if there's ever been a time in history that it's been so easy to be distracted, right? But one of the things that I would consider possibly, and I, I, since I value both of you guys' opinions, especially in this subject, I'm very curious as to, as to what you guys both think, but the transhumanism movement and the AI that is now well, in, it, it's captured a lot of people's attention and consciousness. Where do you and how do you guys see that fitting in with a, a deeper understanding of where we could go, right? Because if I'm to understand that it's, well, I, I've had guys, you know, I, I had a discussion with uh, Dr. Dean Radin, um, you know, and the, the evidence that he put forth for potential uh, one's ability to be telepathic or to experience things and et cetera. Uh, yet we have Elon Musk and uh, not just Elon Musk, but plenty of other people wanting to, you know, plug you into a, some sort of thing, an electronic that can then do these things that potentially, like you guys are saying, we may have and have the ability to do already. So I'm curious what you guys think. Is this a distraction, the AI transhumanism movement? Is it something that we can go through or dance with? Or how do you guys see that? Well, you know, it's pretty interesting, this whole AI thing, because... If you look at it from a perspective as rose-colored glasses, you can see some of the benefits that it can give to humanity, without a doubt. But those benefits could only be realized if the burden of man was released and man didn't have to work to pay any more bills. When you keep the capitalistic civilization going with the current economic system and then you add the AI and all this automation, you're taking away all the jobs, but you still haven't taken away all the bills yet. <laughs> so we have a real big problem because now these machines and this, this artificial intelligence is taking the role and jobs of millions of people. At the same time, those people still have to pay rent and have no way to eat, which is going to increase all kinds of other problems. Crime, drug abuse, suicides. It can cause mayhem. It will cause mayhem if nothing is checked in, the, in that area. The other thing is it's going to... You know, from the from the other side, it's going to give people these godlike powers. And it kind of, for me, relates to the Anunnaki. And I kind of touch on this in one of my chapters in the book where there is a Harvard student that about maybe five years ago developed this device that just sits on the bone right here on the back of the ear. And that that device is connected to Wi-Fi to the Internet. He doesn't have to speak. He thinks and the bone picks up his thoughts and it sends it to Google. He can ask, well, you ask him a question. He then asks the question to Google through this piece that he, you, his mouth never moves. Google then transmits the answer and then vibrates it through the bone behind the ear. He hears it in his head and he can regurgitate the answer to you. Could this be some of the types of devices that were used in the ancient past, giving these people godlike knowledge, omnipotence and everything else? You know, it's very, very possible. Could there be a device that they use to tap into some type of massive database where it was just right into their head, kind of like the Elon Musk thing that he's trying to put out? And so, but when you look at these situations again, if we then become spacefaring, a spacefaring race and we travel, 
and people, you know, we meet people out there and we have this device that's tapped into our database on our ship and we know everything, will they bow down and pray to us? So it has these crazy aspects. Also, the other one that I wanted to touch on, too, was the fact that some people don't think that AI can have a soul. Now, initially, I got to admit, I thought the same thing, too. But then I started digging deeper into what does it mean to have consciousness? And I realized that some scientists at the Brain Institute were just experimenting with a, a tiny couple of grams of brain matter and had created a conscious uh, brain from that. And AI, you know, once it creates a certain amount of connections and it becomes self-aware, I believe what's happening is that self-awareness is now allowing it, when it, when it, be, when it becomes self-aware, it's picking up a frequency from the universal consciousness. It, it encapsulates a small amount of the divine energy that's already floating around. It, it, it encapsulates it and it becomes aware of itself because, in my opinion, there's only one consciousness. So there's so many ramifications and implications to where this can go. There's so much negative that it, you know, it can have. And there's also some positive. But the positivity is hard to get to. And the reason why I came to this conclusion, the people that are programming the AI, the majority of these people are not conscious. In other words, they haven't, they haven't become ascended masters. They haven't ascended to a high level of being. They're not operating in a state of love and unconditional love and passion and service to others. So these are, un unfortunately, these are regular people with all their different, uh, you know, racist mindsets, uh, you know, their belief systems that they were brought up with, that they're still holding on to, uh, and all the other uh, faults of mankind. And so when that person is the person programming the code into this potential future AI software, the AI is as above, so below. It's going to take on the same characteristics as the creator, just like we're taking on characteristics of our creator. So it becomes a real touchy situation. A lot of new laws are going to have to be put in place. And not a, a lot of new um, legislation will need to be put in place. What happens when AI wants rights and things like that, which has already happened with one AI robot, a female. So it's a very touchy situation. I think uh, we're better off uh, right now not digging too deep into it until we can come up with a way that people on this planet are more conscious and we can use it, utilize it to lift the burden of mankind. And the last thing I'll say this before I get off is what I see right now is these smartphones have made us dumb, right? When I was a kid and all of us on this video, we're all, you know, in that age group. When we were kids, we had to know the answers. We couldn't just hop on Google and get answers. It didn't exist yet. But these kids these days, they have to get, they just get on a device or their watch or whatever. They get the answers and they still don't get straight A's. And now with AI doing all your homework for you in a heartbeat, before you finish typing the question to AI, it's already answered all your questions. It's going to take, going to take college exams. They're going to fly through all this medical school, but with no real knowledge. What happens when you have to have the real recall, the information that has to be regurgitated like my, Matt and I do, and you can't recall anything because AI gave it to you. So we're setting ourselves up for this huge fall if we don't catch it really quick. That's my opinion. Yeah, look, let me add a little bit to that because I think those are some great points. Um, I like the my favorite part of that that Billy said is that if we had this restructuring of our perspectives of humanity, and I mean, who knows when we're actually going to be able to get to that place where um, the conscious viewpoint and the consciousness itself does that shift in the planet where everyone all of a sudden you know we we view ourselves differently and we're like oh wow you know I'm a I'm a powerful you know being of the universe so I shouldn't be you know, working at a toll booth or, you know, working at a, at a fast food place, those burdens, I love the idea of AI doing that because we shouldn't be doing tasks like that. We shouldn't like we should, there are things that humans need to do that AI will never, ever be able to do. Like I think sitting down and having just a very important conversation or something like that. I think that AI will never have that emotional connection for you to feel like you're talking to something, someone that like, like a psychologist or something like that. There'll always be jobs that we have to do, right? But those things that we don't need to do, they're going to free us to actually fulfill greater lives. So that's a great thing. And I feel like that's the most positive spin I want to put on AI in terms of this. Now, here's my biggest concern of all. Now, this didn't come up yet. Now, 
if we looking in what in what the ancients said about us, when you look into all the abilities that supposedly we have hidden within us, right? Like, how did they build the Great Pyramid of Giza? You know, two and a half million gigantic blocks, various different sizes, averaging about six to ten you know, tons each. How did they build that? Well, we know it wasn't doing with, with cranes and some kind of, I don't believe with cranes or some kind of technology really seems more like they were using some kind of like a levitation or some kind of an aspect of using their mind and harmonics with voice to, to do those things. Right. Well, that's not tech. That's something kind of like a gift that's within us. It's the same thing with like, you know, of telekinesis, like if someone's going to call you and you, these are abilities that we have within us that we haven't even begun to explore yet. I think that the potential of what we have in us with these types of gifts and these hidden things has only not even like 1% even explored. So those things and like having the power of intention, you know, going to a deep meditation and using your mind and manifesting and doing these things, these are not tech things, okay? These are organic things within our genetics that have to do with some kind of a, a, a tapping into it, like an eternal like source of energy that exists in the universe. This is my concern. So much of what we need to learn is in the past about regaining that, right? Building, building these things that connect us to the stars in the universe in raising consciousness. We've forgotten this, this aspect. We become so focused on all these other things that we've forgotten about the this 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 internal guidance in this this uh, game of you know being blinded by everything outside and not looking within and 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 finding out that that's the greatest thing we can do is like raise ourselves up to become like these gods, right? And all of that is contained in this ancient text, and it's it's within us. But someone can't have those types of experiences with technology. Like if you want to go meditate in like this beautiful um, na natural area with a stream flowing by with the energy of that place, you can't put it on a TV screen and have the same experience as you would in that real place. And I think that's the same thing for anything is that we have to be careful that if we start replacing, adding on all these tech things to our lives, it's going to disconnect us from the spirit in self. The higher self is going to, I believe, is going to become disconnected to be replaced by this technological side that tries to mimic it. But I think it's going to ultimately, if we don't harness it in a certain way, we will become lost. We'll almost become like a bored machine and we'll forget all about this other side of us that is like this connected being of the universe. And so I caution greatly in the, in, in how far we're going to go with trans, transhumanism to, I think, take away everything that makes us who we are. And I echo, I echo your guys's, uh, <clears throat> worries for sure just on on both of those it's it's very hard to to simulate an environment that you can just go out into the or go to the top of a mountain and sit there and say i i, I go crazy about the uh the fact that you know I, I grew up without a cell phone right until whatever i don't for, for me it was 18 16 17 18 is when you know so i'm starting to be on the, the edge of being an adult you can't just, I ran into my encyclopedias just the other day when I was, I was home and I'm looking at it going, this is how I forgot. I love, this I is how I had to, right there. And they're amazing yeah. because you, you, you go into it and it, it's pretty deep. You know, it's not just a little colorful. It, now right? we, you're into it. Yeah. 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 You go to the, you go to your phone now, you type it in and whatever first thing that is there, you read that little really quickly and that's your information and you're done. You're done. And so uh, it, it truly is, and to put it direct, it's, it, it's definitely making you dumber. It's, it's the same. If you don't use it, you lose it. And so you've got to be able to use your brains in, in order to do this. And so uh, I want to touch on what is something that I think is the most important now. Uh, and one of the things that I enjoy the most that you guys have kind of been uh, going around here, which is what is this secret? You guys have kind of touched on it, but what is this exact secret uh, if you could lay it out in layman terms for somebody who needs to understand what it is that I'm missing from these ancient schools and probably the most important part of it, how can I train this? How can I practice this? How can I use this in my everyday experience, you know, to, to do and, and be happier, to, to, to live better, et, et cetera, you know, to avoid anxiety, which is just, you know, clearly on the rise and stuff like that. How do you guys, what have you found from that? 
Yeah, well, Matt kind of hit it on the head a little bit there. He kind of lightly touched on it when he was talking about the fact that, you know, we are powerful beings and that it's time to go to inner space. We have to take a journey to inner space. We keep going to the outside and we're taught and programmed. You've heard me say this before many times on many podcasts and so forth. When we're born, we're given a name, a race and a religion, and we spend the rest of our lives defending a false identity. And that programming code locks onto us so hard that we pass it from generation to generation. It's almost like a curse. And but when we finally relinquish that and give that away and take a journey to inner space to discover who we are, what spiritual powers we have and our connectedness to our higher self, like Matt was talking about. Now we're talking about making some real progress and you want to go another step higher when you begin to meditate and really take a journey within yourself and the voice that you hear in your head morphs from this big, deep voice. And you stop imagining a guy with a white robe and a magic wand, but that morphs into you talking to you. That's when you're getting to a much higher level of consciousness because the voice in your head, it's your voice. It's not this outside illusion voice that you're pretending it to be. It's the voice that you have from your higher self talking to yourself. And that voice should sound like you and nobody else. And so... When you when you start, you know, digging into some of the the ancient mysteries and these ancient texts, you had to be an adept initiate even to get into a mystery school. They had to see something special in you that was yeah. worthy of them spending energy on you. You didn't just exactly. walk in and say, "Hey guys, I want to learn these mysteries." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It worked out that way. They're like, "See you later." Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, cut off his head. <laughs> <laughs> and so. <laughs> You, know, you you have you had to really be somebody that was showing that you were already different in some kind of way. You saw things different. You thought different. You had these these innate, innate skills and abilities that they were like this person. If we can teach them how to tap into this knowledge, they will explode internally, and they can then c- continue to pass down this infinite knowledge that we can give them. And so now we're in the era where this knowledge is available to everyone. Right now, it's not taught openly in schools and things like that. You have to know where to go and, you know, reading books like the one that Matt and I have written and many other books that Matt has written and so forth. And but but the information is out there. And so what happens is we're in the space and the time where mankind is under a new sun. And we're the ones now we are the new sons of Atlantis that are ready and willing, should be willing to take in this knowledge and digest it, discern it, understand it, and activate it. You know, what I learned in all of my studies and the biggest part of how people could learn how to not only study this knowledge and utilize it, it's not just gaining the knowledge. It's not just about, okay, I, I, I studied these mystery school knowledge. I've been reading all these books about esoteric wisdom and understanding and ancient civilizations, and I got all this in my head. Now, what do I do with it? Well, the key is you have to apply it. You see, because knowledge is not power. That's actually not correct. The application of knowledge is actually power. When you begin to apply what you've learned and see it working in your own life, you know, this is why people say, you know, well, Billy, why do you, you know, why do you have these nice cars and nice houses and nice things like that? Well, the reason why I do that is because I'm trying to attract people into, you know, my consciousness web. I want to bring people who are out there who aren't even interested in what I have to say but I'm catching them with a little bit of a diamond. I'm I'm capturing with a little bit of a gleam and glimmer over here. And see, because when people see that things that you're talking about are actually working in your own life and you're showing some level of what they, what they perceive as success. If it wasn't for that success is so many different things, but I understand what it takes to get the people who need to hear this word. And I show that I, I splash it at them. Why? Because I'm showing them, I know how to utilize this information to do whatever I want and work however I want, manipulate and do whatever I need to do in this matrix and make it work for me. And they now believe me because what they're seeing is I've got the proof in the pudding. Now I'm reeling them in. Now they're here. Now they're getting the knowledge. Now let's go. Let's take it to the next step. Apply this in your own life. Start learning how to manifest. Start learning how to help people. Start learning how to believe in yourself. Stop self-sabotaging yourself. And so here comes the neural lessons. And so what we see is this process where first you become the student then the student, when the student is ready, we know the teacher will appear. Eventually, when the teacher is ready, the master will appear. And that's the part that we're all trying to get to because we're learning every single day. Me, Matt, you, everybody, we're all learning consistently. It's a nonstop effort. But the process is an on and upward process. The thing, key, the key thing, though, is once you get the wisdom and the knowledge in your head, 
and you start to apply some of the fundamentals in your life and you see the you see that it actually works that's when you're really making it somewhere and you can begin to then hand that knowledge and wisdom down like the ancients did to the next generation. And when so many people get that, to that knowledge and that understanding over time, we get a certain you know, massive number, the whole planet's going to shift. We just got to get to that trick, that certain number that's going to trigger a mass awakening globally. It's happening right now at a very slow pace, but I think there's another expansion waiting off sometime in the future to happen as well. <clears throat> yeah, that was that was really well said. I, I guess all I can do is add a little bit to that. Um, you know, for me, it's about feeling all this and experiencing it, like Billy said, and not just like a hypothetical concept. I think this is where we need people to understand this because the only way you're going to be able to care about this if is this, it actually impacts you somehow in a real way. You know, if someone starts to read like an ancient hermetic text and they go out like like Billy just said, and they start to actually try to incorporate some of those teachings into their life. And then let's say they're walking along and they're having like that discussion with their selves or their higher self, which I love to do. And I don't care if anyone labels that as crazy or not, but those moments where you try to figure things out, those moments where you're out and you're like, you're just you in the universe. And you're like, I want to understand this. And then you try to like figure it out. All of a sudden, something starts happening. Energy starts flowing in, and you realize you're definitely not alone at that moment. And I've experienced this so many times that it's 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 very um, it's a, almost something that I actually go seek now to go out and find it. And what that tells me is that there is this essence, this energy that exists in the the eternal realms, the etheric realms of this universe. That it, you know, the ether that where this information of who we are and where we come from, it wants to be known. It wants to be pursued. We are supposed to be pursuing understanding who we are and what what role we play in this incredible multiverse universe. And I think that's why when people start to feel this, when they start to incorporate this, you will have something happen in your life that will be so fundamental that you can never go back again. And that's what this hero's journey is. All throughout history, like Billy said, it's about these special individuals that want to know more. They want to go further in life and experience other things. And so they go seeking. They go to try to figure out things, right? They go on a journey, whether it's a physical journey or it's a journey through reading these ancient texts. And before they know it, they're not the same person anymore or the same energy being that they were when they started. And when they put those things into practice, all of a sudden, the ancient the ancient knowledge and the ancient past comes to life and you become a part of it. And you realize to yourself, if this is all just a game, if we are these incredible beings of the universe that incarnate into this physical body, but we forget almost everything, then the game is for us to try to figure it all out again and to try to do it over and over again, almost infinitely until we can ascend to a point where we become so powerful that we almost like disappear as a physical being and we become like these creator gods. This is the game. The game is for us to see how far we can take this life. And every time we wake up and we have another 120 years, how far can we take that? And that, that's what the ancients have left behind the entire blueprint for how to do it. You know, it's like, it's one thing if you wake up and you're in like in medieval times and you're in like an oppressed government and you have no way to access any ancient text or knowledge, there's no way for you to know anything. But what about if you had something completely opposite happen? How about existing in a time where you can pick up your phone and look up any ancient text and anything in the world you want to know about? Right? Imagine the power that you could then take and incorporate that into your life. But the problem is, how do you know where to look? And that's what we're, Billy Carson and I are trying to do is lay down a foundation of say, and say, look, we've spent thousands of hours on trying to read every ancient text and everything we can. Here's what we found to be the most helpful and the most important along our story. And we're trying to bring back the fact that these ancient people knew, I think, I believe everything. I believe they literally were handed down the knowledge of basically everything. And so they wrote out this like, you know, this walkthrough guide to this game. They already wrote it all out, right? Here's how you reach higher states of consciousness and unlock your Kundalini energy and what that does, blah, blah, blah. Like it's all there. Like we're act like there's so much mystery still with this. It's kind of silly actually, right? She's like, why don't you just pick up the guide 
and then just go through the lessons and then you can do it. It's there, but it's hidden. Nobody, but most people don't understand that all these, these, these guides to us unlocking it, they're not within just like Christian text or Hebrew text. They're within all of the ancient knowledge of everything that came before. Whether or not you read the Quran or you read a, a Hebrew text or Christian text, or you read something like a Gnostic text, if you take out anything that's, that was rewritten later as a manipulation, the core of what they're saying is always the same thing. It's always the same thing. It's how do you reach Christ consciousness? How do you take this ancient knowledge and incorporate it? And then how do you become that? And so for me, we're, we're taking something that's already there and we're trying to literally alter all of reality here so that we can take this next step to become like this superhuman species. And that's what, you know, the controllers and those don't want us. They want us to be like a worker, but really we are like an incredible God of the universe. And that's what is so amazing about all this. And so <clears throat> because of that, because it is hidden, so for some people it's not even real, right? Uh, and then for, and then for for others they don't know where. And uh, that is, for me, one of the one of the most uh, let's say most difficult things to come across in the conversations that I have with people that bridge the bridging that gap. And this is one of the reasons why I even have conversations like this, right? Because if you can if you can capture someone in for a little bit of an hour to get into this and something you guys have said will spark that they'll have to go check and go down that go down that route and then like you said it's the application of knowledge which is power which couldn't be more true especially with providing proof for people uh as to you know i am applying this knowledge look at what i can do these people applied this this is what they could do go look at the the, the pyramids go look at this go look at etc and so I'm going to push you guys in a way that I don't think I've seen too much, at least from both of you guys, because I'm a, I am a professional uh, athlete, right? I'm a professional footballer or soccer player, right? Uh, and I, I deal with a lot of guys that, that uh, you know, we teach training and we teach how to do stuff. If you could, before we get off this topic to move on to some stuff that's not even related to this at all, maybe in, in your shortest or not necessarily shortest, but in your best, most succinct words, I want to start tomorrow. I want to. St- I watched this podcast. I listened. I want to start tomorrow. Both of you guys are going to have different, you know, ways. Just like you said, you talk about the Sufis, you talk about the, the Buddhist text, all these texts. It's all there in different ways. They all have different paths to get you to the same point. So, in that sense, if you guys could give me practical, literal advice for a guy or a girl that wants to start tomorrow, mm-hmm. what would you say? Do this. The first thing I say is get Matthew LaCroix's book, The Stage of Time. <laughs> okay, it's the first thing you got to do. Much love, man. Awesome book. Get The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets by me, Billy Carson. Both of those books literally are starting points. I mean, they, they, will, they will take you into this path of going, oh, now I'm starting to get it. Okay. Uh, work on your meditation game. Start learning how to do meditation. Start with guided meditations. There's plenty of guided meditations on YouTube. I have tons and tons of meditations on my TV network, Forbidden Knowledge TV. There's meditations on Gaia. Get into meditation. Learn several types, though. There's manifestation meditations where you're focusing on manifesting things. You're, you're, you're meditating as if you already have it or you already own it or you already are doing it. Not You're trying to get it, not trying to establish it, not trying to, to get it, but it's already there. You're living in the moment within the meditation. You also have the Merkaba meditation, a vehicle of ascension, where you're actually stepping into a star tetrahedron that's rotating counterclockwise, which can take you into higher dimensions. And then the cosmic meditation, which is a meditation that allows you to empty your mind. I see a hand going into the bowl of my mind and taking all my thoughts out little by little until my thoughts are almost gone. And then I let the cosmic energy fill up that cup, fill up that bowl with cosmic information. Those are three meditations that I personally recommend that I do on a varying basis, but I try to meditate every single day. Don't worry about sitting in, you know, the lotus position and all these perfect positions. (laughs) When you wake up in the morning, right, don't get out of bed right away. If you come, wait till your body wakes up, then go into a 15 minute meditation. When you're in the shower, do a 10, 15 minute meditation. When you're doing a hobby, a hobby is meditation. A sport is a meditation. You can do a walking meditation. There's so many ways to meditate, not just sitting like you see 
a Swami doing on, uh, you know, one of these uh, shows. There's so many ways to meditate. You don't have to be sitting in a particular position to meditate properly. It's all about getting into that state of mind. And then also, the next thing I would do is begin for them to begin to understand that the same spark that created everything in the universe, that divine energy, is in every single atom in their body, which means that the power that's out there is the same power inside of them. <clears throat> so what they should be doing is understanding that instead of praying from a position of begging, hoping, and wishing, and trying to cast that kind of spell, because believe in me, they're trying to cast a spell when they pray. When you're praying, you're trying to speak words that are going to alter your future reality in the third dimension, then you're trying to cast a spell. Now, no, matter what, no matter what religion it is, you're trying to cast a spell. But the spell casting, they don't know what they're doing. That's why they don't work. You have to talk from a position of power, speaking things into existence, believing the end before the end. When I hop on a plane, I don't pray and hope and beg I get there safely. I command that I arrive at my destination safely. That's my prayer. That is literally the prayer. So understanding how to pray from a position of power, not from a position of weakness, because weakness, begging, hoping, wishing, wishing, those are low frequency mindsets. We know this by connecting a human being to an EEG and looking at a computer screen. We know scientifically low frequency, but a power mindset, you're connecting with the energetic grid in the universe from a position of power, you're going to get back power, power and positivity. From a low frequency, you're going to get back more low frequency. Those are just a few practices that a person can begin to implement into their life. And the next thing I would say is love thy neighbor. One of the oldest statements in the universe. In other words, treat people as you would want to be, be treated. Respect people. Uh, you know, don't um, judge people and just have an unconditional love. Now, you have to be cautious of people. You have to be wary of people. We understand this. When you say when you hear the word unconditional love for your neighbor, it doesn't mean ah, this guy just molested two kids. I'm going to go over and give him a big hug. <laughs> OK, what it means is you now go back into the command power. I, uh, I'm sending energy to this guy that something will come into his life to change the way his brain is working. Something's wrong with this guy's mind. I'm going to send energy into this guy's mind. I want him to change the way he sees the world, change the way he sees himself. Something, some spark will come from the universe to help uh, create a new person. That's my, that's my command on this person's life. And from that perspective, from a distance... It doesn't mean that I'm running up and giving this guy hugs and kisses, but from a distance, I'm respecting, I'm not judging, and I'm commanding change in this person's life. And that's a form of unconditional love and empathy. You see, so implementing these things into, into your life, step by step by step, walking in this power. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, don't start flickering them off and then running up on their car and honking the horn. Just say, hey, I bless this person. I hope they make it to their destination safely. There must be something wrong with them. Either they're sick, they, they got a phone call that their kids got injured in school, their wife is having a situation, or maybe they're just crazy, right? Maybe they're just bad drivers. I hope they reach their destination safely. You see, that's a great test to your own self, keeping yourself in a brain heart coherence, keeping yourself in check, you know, becoming the observer of your thoughts and not living in the thoughts and becoming a person that reacts to everything. That's when you know if you're getting to the next level. That was a very comprehensive list. And honestly, I guess I can only just, I'll add a couple to that um, just because that was really, really good. I agree. Um, really, I think the what Billy is trying to say is you can't, it's it, the application of this knowledge goes far beyond just ancient wisdom. It's about you becoming a certain kind of heightened being. It's about you becoming like a steward of the planet and caring about the world around you and caring about your fellow people around you. It's about the compassion, but also strength. It's stra strength and compassion and love. They come from a place of you becoming a stronger person. And that's always work that's needed. I mean, it's, it's never ending. Sometimes you're going to have bad days. But if you want to go into it this way, this is what I would do. In order to you to be open to, to be able to first start in all of this, you're reading, you're starting to understand some of this, and you're getting really curious. The first thing you have to do is realize that you cannot hold a certain vibrational frequency that will allow you to entertain an alternate version of everything until you first tear down the pre-existing aspect of how you consider yourself, how you how you view your history, how you view everything. First thing you have to first thing you have to do is basically start over from like scratch being like, okay, so well, what am I really then? Right. I'm not just, am I my physical body or am I my consciousness that is almost like looking down and experiencing this almost like you're looking out of like a window, right? You're like, you're looking out of this, like if you have a VR headset on, 
but you don't, right? You're looking around and this body is, it is a physical organic body that you need to take care of because it allows you to be the vessel that then takes your mind, your consciousness to that place that you want to manifest, right? So you say, I want to reach higher states of consciousness and awareness and incorporate some of this ancient knowledge. Well, the first thing you do is have that intention, clear your slate of everything that's predetermined, start over again. Start retraining your mind again, right? Trees train your mind to being like, well, am I aware of everything around me? You know, you, you're mean, you're rude to someone or you do something bad and then well, be aware of what you just did. Like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Like that was, that was a great example of something I'm not going to do again. And then you start building off of something. Now what you need to do is you need to turn your vessel, your physical body into like a receptor, like a receiver that it allows you to then take your mind, your consciousness, take it to that level. What I mean is our bodies in most cases, unless you are like, a, like Will, John, and you're like running around a sock, a, a football field and you're literally like in the, the, the health state he's in. Most cases, you're probably going to be in, in, in places where you need to make some changes. Like if you're drinking tap water, you are never going to wake up. You might as well just stay asleep forever. There are certain things that have been put into our world, in our foods, in our water, and other things to deliberately keep us asleep, to prevent us from breaking out of this whole thing, okay? So you need to start incorporating some of these things. You have to drink only spring water. You have to start eating healthier food. You have to start exercising. Then take your mind and exercise it. Start being, becoming more academic. You have some free time, Go learn something, like start to build off of something in your mind, start to follow those passions. Like Billy said, incorporate things like meditation and getting out and being appreciative of like your existence in your life. It's so much that it's not really like a one path for anyone. Everyone's going to go down this path a little bit differently, but all you need to do is have the right starting point and the right intention. And you're going to ultimately get there. And I just want to add one, one more quick thing is that this path this hero's journey and the path of what we're, you're trying to do, which is to live, rise up, to ascend to a higher state of energy and consciousness, to break out of an illusion that's been very carefully constructed and created here with so many things that want to prevent you from ever discovering it or ever making it to that, meaning that the journey is going to be very difficult. It is made to be difficult. You're going to have so many things that are going to fall into your path that are they're going to seem like you're not supposed to get there. The, the thing is, the amazing thing is that if you can overcome there and get to that point, the things you'll experience are so profound and incredible that it's like you're being rewarded for that journey of hard work. And so I just want to tell people, go into it knowing it's going to be hard and challenging and then say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to take on this challenge and I'm going to do the greatest, the most challenging thing I can ever do. And that's like discovering the real true essence who I am and literally trying to become the greatest version of myself I can in this life. <clears throat> Very. And uh, going into things, knowing that they'll be challenging is an important thing, especially in a time where we believe that we should just have things immediately, right? I, I want to I lose weight. I, I, I went to the gym yesterday. How come I'm not ripped? Right. And, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's that, that's, it's an important factor, uh, for sure. And since we only have a few minutes left here on this last, uh, question, something that speaking of our, our past, I mean, you guys can remember the nineties and the fact that we could, there was no UFOs on CNN and there was no discussion of a, it's so different now. It's so different. I mean, for some people who didn't pay attention to any of that stuff, right? Uh, maybe uh, they don't understand the switch in which we've made and, and, and where it's going. But I'm just curious as uh, what you guys feel about what's going to be revealed here in the future. Where do you guys stand on this? What, why is this happening now? Just if you could give us some understanding of what, because for me, this is insanity. Like I can, I can remember like 97, 98 and you would get laughed off. Uh, there's just no, absolutely no way. The conversation couldn't even be had. And now we have this Pentagon, this and that. What's going on, right? Because they definitely, they, someone knew about this. This is not new information. So I want to just get an understanding of what you guys feel is what is really happening. Yeah. Well, you know, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I'm going back a little bit further than both of you guys. <laughs> so, 
you know, in 1977, playing in my backyard, I saw a UFO go over my backyard. That's the only thing I can describe it as. Now, I didn't have cartoons. I did. You know, we had cartoons on Saturday afternoon for two hours. There was no Cartoon Network 24 hours cartoons with UFOs and aliens in them. There was only four channels on TV. Cable TV didn't even exist yet. This is how far back I go. We had black and white TVs with foil antennas, and you had to stand in the perfect spot. Sometimes your dad would make you stand there and hold the antenna so he could watch TV. It was crazy. And so I'm outside playing. Now, I knew what a plane looked like because we lived next to a private airport called the Opelaka Airport. Didn't have a tail, didn't have uh, wings, didn't have fuselage, cockpit. And I, this thing cleared the horizon in seconds, and then it came back and stopped, and it just pew, went back the way that it came in, and I was mesmerized. I went to Rainbow Park Elementary the next day. I got done all the Encyclopedia Britannica's on aerospace. I started study, studying and researching from 1977, Rainbow Park Elementary, Encyclopedia Britannica, aerospace. That's where I started. That's how, that's how long it's been that I got into this whole rabbit hole situation. Right Now, I only had one friend that I can talk to. Eventually, that friend went and got this other guy. So me and this, these two guys, we were you know kids. We were kids. There's an empty lot across the street from my house. We'd go in the back of an empty lot far away from all the other kids to talk about what I saw and could these things come from... The ocean, could it be from space? We had no idea. We're just trying to figure it out. I had researched delta wing, swept wing, you know, ballistics, intercontinental, all this stuff. And I didn't see anything that I that I saw in my backyard, uh, going across the backyard, not in the backyard, but going in the sky across. And so it started with this in the field, hiding from people behind trees, talking about it and whispering to a couple of people to eventually, years later, starting to trade VHS tapes with conspiracies and information on it. Then I saw the evolution move from VHS tapes into cassette tapes, then from cassette tapes to CDs, from CDs to DVDs, from DVDs to web forums, which is when I really got my biggest start online was in these web forums. And then from there to web blogs, uh, social media, and now mainstream TV. So I've seen this evolution like a perfect chart on a, on a blue chip stock <laughs> go from here to hear, and it's like, wow, you know, and I always knew that the day would come when I read the Hopi prophecy about maybe 18 years ago now that the world will be connected by this web and information will travel around the world instantaneously. And I knew that when that moment came, if I was alive, my message or my information would be able to travel the globe. And I waited and waited and waited, and finally it came. I heard .com in 1998, IBM.com, black screen, Three letters, dot com. That was the commercial. I went to the bookstore. I looked it up. I said, oh, the World Wide Web. The web, it's here. And I knew the whole world was going to change from that moment forward. And so I've seen this evolution. And, and so it happens. It happens over time. And we're now at the point where it used to be only former military would talk about, you know, their experiences and things that they saw. You know, now they were veterans. But now you have active military saying this stuff openly, and you have the government now openly admitting to the fact that these things do exist as well, and not only declassified documents, but also verbally. Now, some of it is agenda-based. Some of it is we need money, okay? Always follow the money first. So don't get too excited about the UFOs because they always need money. <laughs> it's like going to, you know, unfortunately, it's like going to church. God can do everything, but he just can't handle money. So we always need more of it. And so the government has gone to every, you know, United States government, unfortunately, has gone to every country and they have literally brought democracy to the world. And that democracy means we're going to install a, a dictator that we want, a puppet dictator. We're going to tear down your country, take your resources, put you under our umbrella, and we're going to dominate you. And now that you know, we've done this, we've generated billions and maybe even trillions in money from the war effort. And uh, now we've done this to every single continent on the entire globe. There's nobody left. So we got to go to space. So now we're going to tell you we need the Space Force. There's threats coming in from space. They could be, you know, threats to national security. They're deactivating our nukes. They're activating nukes. They can do whatever they want. We can't catch them. So now we need to divert trillions of dollars into private industries, private corporations, so there's no FOIAs re being requested, no Freedom of Information Act be can be requested from a private corporation so that we can now channel this money into our pockets. We can do these dead-end projects, you know, like they have these special fighter jets that cost 
you know, 18 billion for one and it never works for 10 years and they keep asking for more money. And after they do that for about 10 years, they go, oh, it didn't work. But meanwhile, the guys who run the corporation have made billions of dollars. <clears throat> so they're doing the same thing with space. They're going to continue to pump fear, 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 because they want us to believe that there's this big threat coming from space. And because of that, we need all your trillions of dollars to send into these private corporations that we sit on the board of directors on so we can continue to eat like fat cats. And that's part of the thing. The other part is there are real people out there coming in from space, visiting us, taking a look around, trying to see what the heck is going on. I think some of them have been shot down in the past. It's my personal opinion. Um, so it's a variation of real UFOs and stuff that we actually own ourselves, uh, which is agenda based to generate trillions and trillions of dollars from the economies around the world. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, that was that's a, pretty much what I was going to say in terms of understanding that there's always an agenda involved and we have to be very careful that, you know, if we're seeing something then we're probably supposed to see it, it's not we're oops, I, I didn't mean to have that leaked stuff get on there. So clearly we're supposed to be seeing all these things happening now. Are they are they all extraterrestrials traveling from different star systems? I'd say if I was to guess, I'd say 90% of them are probably secret government technology and they're not really like UFOs from uh, from other places. Why do I say that? Number one, we know that the government is like 70% 70 years ahead on all technologies and we've seen all the things that they're doing in all the secret bases so we know that that's there. Number two, we we also know that if you're an extraterrestrial species you wouldn't just pollute another timeline of a developing hominid or a sentient species. It would be the stupidest thing in the world for you to reach that level of consciousness to be able to even be able to travel to another place, probably not linearly, probably through some kind of a wormhole or some temporal process of like becoming like a non-corporeal being or who knows. But if you're going to do that and go all the way here, uh, you wouldn't be just like floating around everywhere and having everyone see you. So I think it's incredibly complex what's going on right now. And what I would say is that clearly we're supposed to be opening our minds to the idea of aliens or extraterrestrials, regardless of whether or not it's part of an agenda to fuel something for money or whatever it is. Clearly, the intention here is that we're at least all going to not be think that it's stupid of the idea of extraterrestrials or UFOs. I mean, and maybe that's one of the purposes because there always seems to be a lot of reasons for why things happen, right? You know, for like you look at you look at Iraq after 9/11. Obviously, it's not just about oil. It's that's like a good example. There's so many other factors there. And I think that this is the same thing is that we are at this cusp where our consciousness and our mindsets and our, and our limitations and our thinking has gone on for so long and so many people laughed at to talk about anything that's not part of the mainstream that now we're in this stuck in this bubble where we now have to broaden our, our, our consciousness for humanity. Or if, if people were to learn all the things that we're talking about and even just a, a tiny fraction, they would like f literally freak out. I think that if, that it's it's known psychologically that you know granny that's 71 years old that's watching daytime um game shows all day if she was to learn all of this it actually could be quite destructive for a lot of people and some people may like literally take their lives and this is not it's not like a a gentle thing we have to understand the conditioning that's gone on here with people's mindsets and how they exist has been so limited for so long that unless they can broaden people's perspectives and start to at least incorporate some things into into people's lives a little bit they're just going to freak out and i think that it's like a, it, the the knowledge of where we're going and what things are things are happening with unveiling just information that as it is is that we finally we finally like have to trickle this in in order for us to move forward to the next place so is that the entire reason i'm sure there's a lot of other reasons like scare tactics of us then fearing an invasion and then like billy said then supporting something that's like a defense situation there's probably so many reasons for it but in the end of the day um it may end up helping us just because at least people will open their mindsets up to the possibilities of life and things outside of our world. And finally, we can't just be in this illusion of just this little game show, but we can at least broaden our horizons and our consciousness a little bit. So I guess I see it as a good thing overall. 
Guys, there's not enough time in the world uh, for, for me to have you guys as guests. I guess I have my, I'm going to start, I'm going to get to work on my manifestation uh, powers and get us in the same place for four or five hours and do a, do a Will John epic Billy and Matt podcast and uh, go deep because there's definitely some more stuff. I mean, we've covered some great stuff. I want to thank both you guys uh, for, for doing this. Very excited about uh, the epic of humanity. So get that out as quick as you. It couldn't come out quick enough. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll link to everything, obviously, depending on where you guys. Some, a lot of people are listening to this. Some of you guys are, are watching. We will link to everything. Um, but uh, we will obviously do this again. And, and next time, I hope we can go much, much deeper. But thank both of you. Thank you so much. It's been a great honor once again. Thank you, Billy and uh, Will. I uh, I think we need to have like a two or three hour thing. It just this yeah. is just way too short, right? To have this, but yeah, um, oh, for sure, but it's too it's, quick. Yeah. For sure, for I sure. really appreciate yeah. both of you. Um, I always, as always, it's it's fantastic, and I love how Will John just really cares so much about the work that Billy and I are doing. He always just wants to make sure we can get a good talk in there, and I appreciate that about that he cares that much about it. So um, appreciate the three of you guys and our two of you guys. And I really hope that we can um, do something else soon because Billy Carson and I are just about to have the Epic of Humanity ship. And hopefully we can have that shift in consciousness that we, you know, we're, we're, we keep waiting for. Absolutely. Amazing. All right. Well guys, we will see you later. We'll work on that, uh, big time podcast and, uh, we'll catch you guys soon. Oh!